my name is Fahima Mohammed. Um, I am currently working as a life coach and an NLP practitioner and I have been doing this for the last couple of years. Um, my background um, is really in business management um, and I worked in a law firm but then since then I've been married with uh, having two children and um, it's only recently that I've had the life coaching career. Previously, I have been raised and brought up in South Africa. That's where I was born and my family are all from there from many, many decades ago. Um, I have history probably from my dad's side um, who are from Afghanistan. A lot of South Africans actually, the Muslims, they come from Malaysia, Indonesia and parts of Asia. But I consider myself South African because um, we've been there for so many years. However, we grew up in a society that is um, of minority Muslims, but we have a very strong uh, influence um, within the country. So we can hear the Adhan, we can perform um, whatever rituals that we feel we can. So growing up, as a Sunni, I, you know, was very much um, exposed to religion in a in a big way, because the Muslim community in South Africa, um, even though they're in small numbers, they do practice. And the Sunnis in South Africa, when I was growing up, um, actually did uh, majalis, and they did actually recognize the Ahlul Bayt. And for my family, it's quite normal. So um, it's only when I actually came to London when I was 11 that I realized the actual uh, differences between Shia and Sunni. I never really heard of that too much growing up. And the curiosity started from when I was at uh, college, when I was like 16, 17. Um, I've heard bits and pieces of uh, the Shia. Um, people would mention that, you know, they're not really Muslim or, you know, they don't believe in our Prophet, peace be upon him, because they believe in, you know, the usual, you know, they just believe in Imam Ali, alayhi salam. So that was my first understanding when I first, you know, heard of Shia Islam when I was in college. And I met an Iraqi girl. Uh, she was in my tutor when I was in college and you know we started talking we were really good friends and I questioned her about you know Shia and so she she gave me lots of books and information and I met her family and in my college there was a group of Iraqi people um, and so you know I just generally became friends with that group and sort of hung around with them a lot and especially her and her family. And then when I read the books, I became more knowledgeable about it. And I was like, oh, you know, this is what I've heard, that you're not really Muslim. And she started laughing and then she kind of explained it to me. And just being curious, you know, the kind of person that I am and being brought up in a family that allowed me to be curious because even though we have our ways, they've, you know, I was lucky enough to uh, be brought up in a family that actually allows me to open my mind and, you know, to study more and be open to learning more than just what they have taught me. And that's why it's led to this. Um, as I read more about Shia Islam, it made so much more sense to me. It kind of answered questions that I felt um, I was never really, um, you know, told about before. And things, you know, in the past was very general or on the surface. Whereas when I studied more and read more about Shia Islam, it just, sat naturally to me and it made so much more sense and I've always prayed and my family have always made me um, you know like when it's Friday you know when it's Thursday night when it's you know certain times of the the week the month whatever we had you know we had to pray we had to do you know our salah we had to read Quran and you know we were brought up like that so I felt that you know I always had the guidance and I wanted more. So for me, this was like an opening. This was for me um, a way of, you know, going into a path that was, you know, really what was meant to be. So even though I moved from South Africa at the age of like 10, 11, came here and did my high school and continued with my family, still praying and never left our religion and our ways of being brought up. Um, when I was in college, I think that's when 
um, I really chose my religion. So it wasn't really about um, Shia, it was me wanting to know how to live. And at that age, I was curious about what I can and cannot do, and I'd ask my parents more questions about the meaning and the understanding of Islam. So when I read the books from the Shia uh, sect, it gave me all the answers that I was looking for very quickly, and it just made sense. Just generally, I think about everyday life, and you know and who to follow and the way in which the Shia they have you know the certain um, a certain way and understanding of you know explaining things generally how to live and the, and whatever questions like you know the way in which we pray and why we would pray on the turba for example and obviously reading the book you know then I was guided it was basically everything in there you know, that was a journey that I felt I was following and sort of living myself. And I didn't even know I was going to go into this path because at the same time, um, I actually put the hijab on as well because I wasn't wearing the hijab until the age of like uh, 17. And I did it even before I left college because I was almost, you know, finishing college and I could have done it thinking no one knows me and I could start fresh at university. But for someone like me, the way I've been brought up, it's not about other people. It's not about doing things for anyone. It's really about doing it for me because that's how I was brought up by my family. So, um, and I have a very strong personality and I have a very strong backing on thinking like that. So for me, it's like, it didn't matter that I only had a few months left, you know, and then I could have, you know, started fresh and put the hijab on. I did it there and then so those, you know, current friends could see me and my changes. And it wasn't about anyone, it was about my belief. I constantly felt that I wanted to wear it and I didn't like the way I looked and I didn't feel you know, good about myself because everywhere I went, I saw people with hijab and like few years, you know, like 15 years ago, it, was, it wasn't that, you know, in the area that I live in, in Richmond, in Surrey, you don't see that many, and maybe now more, but even still. So it was always in front of me, like as if it was, you know, um, a sign for me to put it on. And at the same time, you know, having my friends around me who were Shia. And then I went to the Hui. That was the first mosque that my friend uh, took me with her mum. And she's quite old. And, you know, I'd make sure I'd sit next to her and get a chair for her. And I'll sit, you know, by her feet. And she'll explain to me, you know, what was being said and the Akmal. And, you know, everything made sense. And we'd go from Haram. And then I'd go for the, um, I went for even the march, you know, for the Arba'in and you know the 10 days and you know it was just amazing in London and I remember it being so hot but you know wearing all black and but everyone was there marching and the feeling was unreal it was just um it was just the place that I needed to be and you know it felt that this is Islam this is the way you know um this is how you know life should be you know living as a Muslim and as for my family, at first when they saw me put the hijab on, they were like, um, they didn't think I was serious because I was quite young. They never stopped me. They just questioned me, are you sure, you know, you want to do this? And, you know, because my mom doesn't wear it. And at that time, my younger sister obviously didn't wear it. So it was only me. It was a big step. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm putting it on. And that's it. And that was a decision I never looked back, you know, with regret or anything, even though it was slightly difficult. But, you know, I made it work. And I just went with it. So it was, it's an age where most people sort of rebel, but I went the other way because I felt I needed stability in my mind, in the way I was living. So when I put the hijab on, that was the first step. And then I read so much. I read about Karbala. I read so many books. Don't ask me the names. I've read loads. And I need to go back and reread. But when I did read those books, it was just so inspiring. It helped me understand who I was as a human as you know my reasons for being here we we have the Quran we have the translation we have you know all the stories that we hear from the Imams in the mosques but when you just read books from the Shia sect for me it opened up so much more uh, meaning and understanding about everything and questions generally are like, you know, why are we here? Why are we doing what we're doing? The ins inspiration of all the characters that are mentioned and just 
just generally, you know, the stories, it just made sense. It was like chronologically, you know, from the time of our Prophet, peace be upon him, as well as, you know, the family and, you know, the stories of even the companions and everything. It was just sort of like the puzzle just came together and it just made sense. It wasn't surface. It wasn't, um, you know, just talk from picking, you know, hadith from this book or that book. It, everything just was solid. That's how it felt. It was just really solid information. And even as I'm growing up at a certain age to choose a certain marja to follow, that for me also gave me like Islam being current because I could go somewhere, not just follow some imam or someone that's just given a fatwa or whatever it is on certain rulings. It was really, um, how can I say, it was just very um, current, it was modern because this is Islam. It's everyday living. It's about issues that we're dealing with in this current situation. And I could go and get answers. So that's why I felt that, you know, now I truly understand my religion. Now I truly understand what Islam means. And things I've heard growing up, it kind of made sense now. And my family, um, they didn't really say much about me being Shia because for me, I, I just prayed, I did what I did, um, and I just, uh, I learned how to pray in the Shia way, and it just really happened so smoothly, and they probably didn't notice, but what they noticed was the fact that I was changing to be someone who is much more responsible anyway, uh, much more focused, and to be fair, like, my dad always lectures us as a family after, you know, Friday prayers, and he'll come and tell us what happened in the khutbah and whatever it was, you know, it always related to what I was going through um, in anything in life. So he's done that up till today. He's my life coach, you know, and my mom's always like, you know, you have to pray, you have to dress a certain way, you have to have respect, whether you wear hijab or not. You have to have manners, you know, akhlaq, you know, or discipline, everything, you know, respect, you know, so the combination of my, my parents, you know, was the foundation for me to actually grow. And the way in which they taught me Islam is that, you know, I'm open. And when I told them and explained to them about the Shia in, in the fact that, you know, it's, it's something that we did in South Africa as well, but only it's limited. And the Shia, you know, it's, it's a whole body of, you know, exactly what Islam should be from beginning to end. So they, they didn't really, you know, isolate me or think I was strange or deter me from being that in being in that direction. They just let me be. But we do have our debates about certain things. And, you know, now it's a healthy debate because it's just us sharing different ideas. And we are respectful. And it's strange because my children and I, um, we will pray differently. We will have different ideas. Eid, but we'll go maybe travel so we can, you know, break our fast to celebrate with the rest of the family, which, you know, most Shias would do some even between the families. And sometimes it might annoy my mom because, you know, she's like, oh, you know, it's just like, you know, everyone should be the same and this, that and the other. But, you know, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of respect for the fact that, you know, I have been brought up with my family being Sunni and me taking on being Shia and we still make it work. You know, they haven't isolated me. When I went back to South Africa, though, to be fair, a lot of people were alarmed by the fact that I was vocal, that I am Shia. Um, but I was quite proud to just share the information that I know, and um, whatever they thought, that's their opinion. But I'm strong only because of my belief and my faith and, you know, my values. So, if people don't like it, then, you know, that's that's their thing. And I haven't had any one-to-one -one real aggression. I was quite fortunate in that way. Um, I don't know what the future is going to be like for my children, you know, being in a family that is mixed like that. And obviously nowadays it's slightly more testing and challenging. But at the same time, you know, um, I have brought them up to to understand that this is the way forward and I want them to also take on the journey that I have and learn and read more because reborn is not just about Sunni to Shia it's it's so many stages in life 
and even being brought up as a Muslim, as a Shia, you really have to go out there and search. You really have to take your religion for yourself, not just because your family have given you that gift or you're blessed in that way. You really have to take it upon yourselves and choose for yourself your religion, even if it means the same. But take that responsibility of learning and educating yourself so that it's not just given to you and you're just following it blindly. And I think that everyone will be reborn because they've taken it upon themselves to do. I was um, married to an Iraqi for over 11 years and I didn't wear the hijab for him. I didn't become Shia for him. I was all of that before. And people nowadays, they choose uh, after, which is also fine as long as you're strong to know that it's something that, okay, you love that person, you want to be with that person and you want to follow their way. But I think it's more important to choose because of the love of Allah. And I think it's important so that whether that person's in your life or not, you've got to carry those values and beliefs regardless. And especially when there's children, you know, then they're not going to be confused because you're not confused. So I chose to marry a Shia because I felt that that's my way of living. People can choose and say it doesn't matter with Shia and Sunni. And no, it doesn't matter. You know, we're all Muslim. We have the basics and the foundations. But the way in which I live my life, it is part of my, my life. My religion is part of my life. The way I pray, the mosques that I go to. I would go to different mosques, but the way in which I choose to pray, the way in which I choose to follow certain rules and regulations, and I want my kids to, you know, have that influence, then it's easier for me to have someone of the same understanding and belief. So I chose to marry someone who was Shia, and that was the first attraction, you know, to marry. And he happened to be Iraqi, and we were married for over 11 years, have two beautiful children. Unfortunately for me, um, I was betrayed, and, you know, we ended in divorce not very long ago, about a year and a half ago. Um, and that was another journey for me and another challenge for me because I was kind of reborn again. You know, first, you know, hijab and then, you know, change of sect. And then having children is a challenge. And, you know, coming into a new community, Iraqi, you know, everyone sticks to their own. It's not just the Iraqis, the Pakistanis, everyone. And being South African and being in the minority, even again in England, there's not many Muslim South Africans here. And I was in a crowd of Arabs, uh, mainly Iraqi from college. And, you know, I, I felt like, you know, I sat with them quite well. And I loved the culture. And for me, it was... It was, wasn't so much to do with um, Arab, it was more to do with the Shia. And, you know, I blended with the going to the mosques and meeting, you know, sort of those sort of people. And I, you know, I made friends personally. But, like, being divorced was a real challenge for me because, you know, I'm playing both roles, mom and dad. Even the dad is present, but, you know, when you're not in the house, you're not in the house and it's not the same. And, you know, you can give all the financial backing and you can, you know, come however many hours a week. It's not the same as being there 24-7 and taking on the responsibility, you know, that your what your kids are going through. So my faith really came in then because a lot of people, they will fall and crack and break. Even though I felt it inside, I didn't show it because that's when my belief really, really, you know, shined. Because I knew that this was a test and a challenge. So, and it's from Allah, and it's only a blessing. And actually, we mention a lot of the Imams and, you know, we have inspiration from them. But just the other day I was talking to somebody and, you know, people are like, we don't have time to learn about these things. But sometimes you just question someone, like who inspires you? And he told me a story of uh, the seventh Imam, Imam Musa al Qadim alayhi salam. And he was imprisoned for most of you know his life, like I think 34 years altogether. But the way in which he looked at it was the fact that he thanked Allah for the fact that he was imprisoned because it gave him the opportunity to actually be like, he looked at the prison as a sanctuary so he can pray within those four walls. And that sort of, you know, touched me because I felt that you know, in life we have so many challenges and we look at it as like, oh, we're being punished and, you know, we cannot handle it and what do we do wrong and why do we have to go through this and we don't deserve this. But, you know, the reason why I have my career is only because of my belief in my religion. I look at life coaching um, because 
it, it, it's so easy for me because I have been taught to live that way, you know, from my belief. And this story has inspired me and I'm like, it's how I've taken on my challenge because I'm like, okay, I'm in the situation where I'm divorced, I'm left with my kids and it's not a nice situation. The opportunities are not the same, but at the same time, I know there's a reason for this and I'm going to grow from this. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to evolve. And I don't know how I had the strength. Well, I do. I prayed and I, I cried, you know, not just in front of my family and friends when I needed to, but in my salah, you know, when I'm talking, you know, to the one person that I have the most connection with. And at the end of the day, you only need that. You know, I think you have to know yourself very well. If there is a gut feeling for you to go out there and search, for you to go in there and find out, just do that. You know, read a lot and talk to people. You know, people give you advice, uh, but by not even giving you advice, by just, you know, sharing their own experiences. I learn a lot from people and, you know, they say that when you're, if you're clever, you'll be, you know, experiencing things for yourself but if you're wise you learn from other people's experience you don't need to go through certain experiences you don't have to go through everything in life to say that you know I've learned because I've done that I've been that I watch people you know I take it in good and bad and I'm you have to be open to exploring you have to be open to being uncomfortable you have to be open to you know facing a little bit of, you know, discomfort. Because when we are just so used to the same old, you know, routine and life and it's easy and our family did it this way, so we're just going to follow it this way because that's the right way. It's it's kind of like a really, um, it's a cop-out. It's kind of like a very simple way of living. And when people like that live, they do tend to be very unfulfilled and unsatisfied and actually unhappy. When you go out there living life because you're passionate and you can be passionate about any job, it's not about having the top job, it's about making that, that job you know, top because you feel and you look at it as a calling. It could be however low or high in whatever people look as you know, in certain professions. But even I know um, my car battery ran out the other day and I met this guy from the AA and we had an amazing conversation and he's like, he looks at his job as being something as, you know, as helping people. It's a service. Whereas others will be like, oh, I'm just, you know, fixing someone's car. So it's how you look at life. It's how you perceive things. You can make anything passionate. You can make anything beautiful and wonderful if you feel that whatever you're doing is a service. It's a calling. And you look deeper for whatever it is that you're in. And yes, we all aspire to the norms of, you know, being on top of whatever game we're at. But I think by being where you are and making it the best is the most powerful way. And if you want to search for more and if you want to read more, don't be scared of jumping into the other side of things. Don't be scared of um, reading something or sharing something with somebody. You know, I think that we just all want to conform. We all want to fit into certain societies and communities. We don't want to be individuals. Even I teach my children. Um, people are like, oh, um, how are we going to, you know, teach them not to do certain things because everyone's doing it. I'm like, so if everyone's doing it, doesn't mean it's right. It's because you are making them feel that whatever thing everyone else is doing, that we have to do the same thing. You see, we need to step back and how, learn how to live life as individuals. And we have to learn how to bring up our children as individuals, even from our own families, because that's what got me to where I am. And we have to be also aware that they're gonna make mistakes. And we have to be there to be that support system and that influence. And we gotta build that rapport. We gotta build the trust with the people and the family around us so that if they go astray, they're still gonna come back to you and you're gonna still have that imp impact on them, which is stronger than their friends because you've got that trust and they know that they're gonna trust what you say. 
So you have to build your character. The only way you build your character with strength is to know yourself, is to have personal development, not in courses, not just that. These courses are just a foundation of you going and searching and seeking what you are. I don't get influenced that easily. I will learn from different books. I will read and, you know, get and do so many courses and people will just go like a cult and follow that particular way because it makes sense. I take bits and pieces and I make it into what I know that conforms to what my values and beliefs are and that for me is my religion. That for me is the way life should be lived. And our religion has all the answers. It's just that when you go to different courses, you know, when you learn about mindfulness, when you learn about meditation, when you learn about, you know, all the different things, it's already in our religion. It's just that we just don't know how to read it properly. But it's all in our religion. So everything I've learned, even psychology and being positive and, you know, existentialism about, you know, philosophy and life and how to be, it's all in Islam. But people are going to courses and they're making it like that's the, the way of living. Which is fine because, you know, I want to attract all crowds from all backgrounds. So I need that language. I need to articulate it in a certain way. But it's all within me anyway. Because if you're brought up in the proper Islamic way, it's all there. The key is there. The treasures are there. And even if you don't have all the knowledge, if you have the belief that you want something, and you pray and you ask sincerely, there is no way that it's not going to come to you. Absolutely none, and I guarantee that.